Well, good afternoon and welcome to the session on Can Income Be Both High and Safe? My name is Marty Fridson. I'm the publisher of the Income Securities Investor Newsletter. And if you haven't already taken the opportunity, I encourage you to pick up a copy. Uh, uh, some of them are on the uh, seats on the aisles and a couple of the rows here. And also, um, uh, the, uh, this smaller handout has uh, copies of the slides that I'll be using here. Uh, and so it's convenient if you want to make a few notes or whatever. There's also um, contact information on the last page of it about the newsletter. And also uh, my other role is uh, chief investment officer for Lehman Livian Fridson Advisors, which follows an income uh, strategy related to what we do in the newsletter. Many of the securities we use are ones that have been recommended in uh, the Income Securities Investor Newsletter. So, <clears throat> um, I, uh, this presentation um, may be a little different from some of the others. Uh, that w there have been many excellent ones. I've attended some of them that have, have been outstanding. And, uh, but it'll be a little different perhaps in that uh, there is no short-term forecasting of uh, the market uh, in this presentation, uh, certainly no economic forecasting. Uh, you know, there's a saying that if you forget your phone number, an economist will estimate it for you. And uh, it's uh, kind of, uh, I think, true about uh, the value of uh, some of the input you get from them. I, um, the, uh, uh, so the uh, sole focus of this will be on generating income that's both high and safe. And accomplishing that is not as easy as it used to be. Uh, there was a time when you could uh, put your money in the bank and generate a very uh, respectable return. Uh, that's uh, no longer uh, the case. And um, just to illustrate this point, um, this is a historical graph of the uh, yield on uh, the three-month Treasury bill, uh, going back quite a ways, and uh, some of us remember these kind of peak years, uh, and of course, the rates are uh, uh, closely connected with inflation. We were in a very high inflationary period uh, back when this series was uh, peaking. And uh, then in the last few years, you can see it's almost like a, uh, an electrocardiogram of someone who has expired at this point uh, up until a little bit of a rise just in the last uh, uh, period, uh, but still at a very low level by historical standards. Uh, Treasury bill rate now right around 1.9%, and the Federal Reserve is doing its very best to lower the return on that in real terms, inflation for adjusted, to zero. Uh, the, uh, the inflation target, as you, you may be aware, at the Fed is 2% a year. Uh, they haven't achieved that yet. It's been hanging around 1.6%. But uh, I can assure you they're working very hard. They're, they're doing their best uh, to get it up there so that you will be unable to uh, keep pace with inflation uh, through this uh, super safe type of investment. So just give them a little bit of time. and. I uh, think they will be able to achieve that uh, goal. But the uh, good thing about uh, an investment like Treasury bills is that there's very little movement in price uh, in that series because it is assumed that the federal government is always good for it, and because it's such a short maturity, it cannot move very much in uh, reaction to uh, changes in interest rates. So. If uh, your goal is to uh, preserve perfectly stable principal value, this is your investment. However, if you want to eat, uh, it's a little different uh, story. And uh, the story there is that uh, you, if you want to get a higher yield, uh, an, an yield a yield that is uh, in excess of the inflation rate, and uh, can provide uh, satisfactorily for your needs, you have to accept a certain degree of interim fluctuations in the value of your portfolio. That is just 
a fact, I mean, that's period, you know, end of, uh, end of sentence. Uh, that is a basic trade-off that you have to accept. I mean, you can annuitize it and give up the principal, but if you want to retain the uh, portfolio and uh, generate a, a high income, you're going to have some ups and downs. So the objective, given those constraints, is number one, avoid permanent losses of capital. And those arise when, for example, you own a bond that defaults. Uh, you may recover some portion of your original investment, but uh, on average with corporate bonds, you lose about 60% of uh, the original principal if you bought it at par. And that's not a loss that will be made up through time. Whereas uh, you might buy a bond with a 10-year maturity uh, because of increases in credit risk in the uh, overall environment, a rise in interest rates, uh, the value of your investment may go down, but you will make that up eventually. Uh, if the bond doesn't default, you'll get your principal back at, uh, uh, at uh, the value you paid for it, or it may even, uh, you may even get a gain if the bond is called at a premium prior to maturity. Um, and this uh, similar kind of uh, thinking applies. We don't uh, deal in the uh, newsletter by any means only in bonds. Uh, actually, the biggest part of it is preferreds. I'm going to get into some of the different asset classes in a little bit more detail in a moment. But so objective number one is avoid permanent losses in principle. And number two is it is reasonable to try to limit the swings in the value of your portfolio. And um, in the key to doing that is diversifying not only by owning different securities in the portfolio, but also owning different types of securities. And uh, uh, as you can see in the newsletter, there are several different categories that we emphasize. We make recommendations every month in and then um, maintain coverage on those. Um, you'll see a number of uh, previous recommendations listed in the newsletter. There's a website associated with the newsletter that has a much larger universe of uh, past recommendations and uh, updated information about pricing and yields and uh, rating, uh, credit ratings and the rest are all uh, provided on that website. Um, now, um, the accepting some level of fluctuations is another, uh, another name for taking risk. And uh, there are two basic ways of taking uh, risk in the uh, income securities uh, universe, and those are taking credit risk or taking maturity risk. And let me uh, uh, explain a little bit more about those. So uh, first of all, uh, you can uh, increase your yield uh, with the understanding that it will introduce a certain amount of volatility to your portfolio uh, by... Um, accepting the risk that the security will, at least temporarily, become less valued because uh, there is greater concern about uh, economic fundamentals or the fundamentals of that particular company, and uh, that will depress uh, the price for a period of time. So what I've done in this uh, graph is uh, moving from left to right, I show the uh, higher and higher risk premium on uh, issues within the universe of preferred securities. And this includes uh, preferred stocks, but a variety of other you know, trust instruments and other types of uh, things in the preferred category, you know, the junior uh, piece of the capital structure of the company. And uh, the, uh, the uh, because the um, uh, risk premium issue by issue increases, uh, the yield increases. So the, the risk premium is defined as the difference between the yield on a preferred or a bond and the uh, comparable maturity U.S. Treasury security, which is uh, somewhat erroneously called default-free. It's really def or, or risk-free. It's really default risk-free, but of course the Treasuries uh, are also subject to fluctuations related to 
uh, rises and declines in interest rates. So as you move uh, from, uh, uh, from left to right on uh, the uh, uh, chart, um, the, uh, you, you see a uh, higher and higher yields uh, within the, that universe of preferreds. And what I did here was I took a month where there was a particularly uh, large increase in uh, those uh, spreads versus treasuries, um, uh, the risk premiums. So, um, and as a result of that, uh, the uh, price change for the index as a whole was a drop of about two and a half percentage points. But it made a big difference what level of risk you had taken prior to that increase in risk and overall decline in the market. And uh, you can see uh, very clearly if you're in the shortest uh, uh, or the uh, lowest risk issues within the preferred index, uh, it was uh, almost a non-event for you, uh, whereas um, you had uh, a loss of uh, about 6% for one month, which uh, uh, I know one of uh, the other presentations, they talked about annualized returns. <laughs> and that can be a dangerous thing, but a 6% loss in one month, of course, is a, a pretty, uh, pretty tough hit. Um, so uh, th this is one, one type of risk that you face. But again, you're getting a higher yield the more of this risk that you're willing to take. Now, the second uh, kind of risk that you can take in connection with income securities is to uh, go out further and further on the uh, uh, spectrum of maturities. And in most periods, the longer you're out, uh, the longer you're li tying up your money for, the higher the yield that you'll uh, get. I think that over the past couple of months, more people than ever before have been uh, learned about the uh, phrase of uh, the um, inverted yield curve, which uh, uh, applies specifically to the Treasury bonds where the shorter dated, let's say two-year uh, treasury yields have for a period of time been higher than the 10-year treasury yields. But this is quite an unusual uh, uh, situation. And for corporate bonds and uh, treasuries, it uh, generally continues to be the case that you get paid more uh, uh, as you're out in the longer uh, maturities. So here I selected a month where you had a very big increase in the level of treasury rates and uh, in uh, this case, you had a, uh, a price decline of uh, about 1.74% for the index as a whole. Uh, but again, uh, it uh, made quite a bit of difference where on that spectrum you were. And this was uh, on specifically investment grade bonds, those rated triple B or higher. Uh, this low investment grade rated b double B or below will tend to have less exposure to fluctuations in the underlying treasury yields and more sensitivity to the, um, uh, the, the uh, overall view of uh, credit risk in the market. Now, uh, you may be thinking, well, there is another way to deal with this issue of uh, volatility and market fluctuations, and that is to uh, sell before the market goes down and buy uh, before it starts to go up again. Now, if you're able to achieve that, uh, I urge you right after this uh, session ends, call up Goldman Sachs uh, because they have a $20 million a year trading job waiting for you. Uh, the fact is that Goldman Sachs does not have anybody who can do that and uh, consistently, and neither does any other financial institution. So if you have that skill, they'll not only want to pay you $20 million a year, and you may be able to negotiate even a better deal, they'll probably also want to take out a $100 million uh, key person life insurance policy on you because you're such a valuable employee to them if you're able actually to do this. So uh, I think you can guess that my advice is not to rely on market timing as a strategy for dealing with market fluctuations. Um, the... Uh, uh, you know, it, 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 this is a graph that shows, um, in a very simple way, uh, again, the below investment grade uh, bond index uh, issues rated double B or below. Now, it happens that 
uh, the last point on this, the most recent date, was kind of the high point in the series. Uh, if that were not the case, you'd see this diagonal, you know, straight line going through and have some points above and some point below. But nevertheless, you get the same basic idea of the trend line shows that you wind up at the same place uh, whether you, you know, bought and remain invested through the period or try unsuccessfully uh, with uh, complete assurance uh, to, you know, always buy at the uh, lows and sell at the, t uh, the highs. So you wind up in the same place, but the difference is that during those periods when you're out of the market, in addition to all the transaction costs you've incurred uh, along the way, while you're out of the market, you're not getting this high yield. So you're pretty much guaranteed to perform worse by uh, jumping in and out of the market continuously. Uh, not to say you'd you know, never make some adjustments at the margin if um, you have a very strong conviction about the um, uh, coming uh, environment, uh, but uh, this also assumes that you're ahead of the rest of the world in figuring that out. So it, uh, I think I've found that humility goes a long way uh, in, uh, toward investment success. Uh, this also does not uh, imply a pure buy and hold period, you know, one, one decision, uh, you know, stocks or bonds, uh, forever, because um, these uh, securities individually do have uh, what would be uh, technically referred to as idiosyncratic risk, but in other words, they have uh, the risk of uh, declining because of a fundamental change in that individual security that has nothing to do with any general trends in the economy, uh, cyclical, secular, or otherwise. So it does require maintaining uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, a view on and an understanding of what's going on at the company that has issued these uh, securities and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, monitoring that can be a substantial job. It, it, it has a, uh, an impact on how widely you're going to diversify in terms of number of issues. Uh, within our company, we have uh, the resources to maintain uh, uh, you know, uh, surveillance on a sizable number of issues. So uh, portfolios will typically uh, have about 50 securities in them so that uh, the exposure to any one security is you know, typically only about 2%. Um, that uh, is kind of a large universe, uh, I think, uh, to follow as an individual. Uh, it's possible if you have the time to do it, but um, we uh, make use of technology in doing that. For instance, in the preferreds, we monitor a universe of about 1,000 issues and have a model for valuing them so that we can identify uh, when the issue is becoming uh, expensive or uh, cheap, and we can replace some of the more expensive ones with a cheaper one, uh, make it, making use of that uh, analysis. But um, the uh, uh, you know the right solution uh, to volatility again is not to uh, try to time the market uh, without success, but uh, to um, diversify by asset class and. Uh, this is a good illustration over the latest 12 months of uh, how things are gone, have gone. If you had a portfolio that uh, divided uh, your holdings among these different asset classes, um, master limited partnerships, which is the big down uh, bar in this graph, uh, had a pretty tough year. Uh, it, Throughout this, we've considered them to offer very good value, and uh, you know they'll they'll come back at some point, uh, and the yields are very attractive on them right now. Um, but despite that uh, huge drop in that one asset class, uh, the others, by and large, uh, performed uh, pretty well, holding even or uh, improving. And this is strictly the price change. I'm not talking at all about the yield, uh, which. Uh, included the master limited partnerships was very substantial. But if you're concerned about uh, maintaining reasonable stability in the uh, overall value of your portfolio, this was a really good illustration that you can sustain uh, fairly large drops. And here I've simply assumed an equally weighted portfolio among all these different asset classes. That's 
by no means the optimal, and that's not what we generally would uh, use in our investment uh, management business. We make uh, we review that asset allocation every month, um, but just for sim simplicity, we said, well, here, if you were equally weighted, uh, you, you could have sustained uh, that huge drop in that one asset class. Um, and this is the reason that diversifying by asset classes uh, works. Um, as you look at these different asset classes, you find that the key risk I is different from one to another. So if you own investment grade corporate bonds, you'll find that they move pretty closely with treasury bonds. And treasury bonds are you know, defined as the level of interest rates in the economy. So uh, if uh, rates go up, you're going to see a pretty direct connection uh, with corporate bonds. They won't move up 100% or down 100% with uh, the treasury index, but uh, they'll t tend to move pretty closely with them. Um, now, if you look at investment grade preferreds, they're um, really uh, what you have to be concerned about is, uh, for the most part, the health of financial institutions. Banks and other kinds of financial companies are the main issuers. There are some industrials and utilities, and uh, we are very interested in those if we can find uh, good names in those categories because that provides some diversification within the preferred asset class. But if you have an overall uh, unfavorable environment for financial institutions, you are going to see some pressure on that asset class. But again, it's different from what you're seeing in the others. And uh, you don't typically, uh, I think it would be uh, essentially unheard of to have all of these things go wrong at the same time. And that's uh, really the, the idea of it. In the case of uh, a high yield or below investment grade, corporate bonds, uh, really the uh, concern there is recession. At that point, uh, uh, more or less coincident with recessions, you'll see the default rate on high yield bonds escalate and reach a peak uh, sometime during or perhaps slightly after uh, the recession. But they start to escalate as the recession is approaching. And when the default rate goes up, investors become uh, concerned about the whole asset class, and in extreme cases such as uh, the fall of 2008, you saw a number of issues that really were not at any meaningful risk of going into default anytime soon, but they were trading at distress levels, believe it or not, you know, 10 percentage points above uh, comparable treasuries, uh, even in the case of some double B rated securities, the highest rated within that below investment grade category. That, that, that was certainly a great buying opportunity uh, for, uh, for those securities. Um, the high yield or below investment grade preferreds, again, primarily the financial institutions. Now bear in mind that in a lot of cases, because those preferreds are junior in the capital structure, they are rated lower than the senior secured debt or the senior unsecured debt or even subordinated debt of the financial institution. So uh, you may have a below investment grade rating on an institution that is actually uh, an investment grade uh, institution, and those can be pretty good opportunities. Companies um, are very reluctant to uh, omit a preferred dividend, uh, even though they have the, the ability to. It sends a very negative signal about the company, so they'll go to great lengths to avoid uh, of, avoid doing that. Um, so uh, the, the other attraction, by the way, of preferreds is that many of them are uh, relatively small issues. Uh, so the very big money managers, mutual fund organizations, so on, can't really buy enough of them to have an impact on their portfolio. So there's not a lot of uh, uh, institutional research on the preferreds, and we do see significant um, divergences from fair value if you look at them relative to other similar securities. Uh, a couple of big orders are big for uh, uh, an issue that may be only $100 million outstanding, for example. Uh, a few uh, big orders on an issue that doesn't trade uh, that, uh, that deep a market can have an, uh, a big impact on the price and create an excellent opportunity to come in and buy. Um, for real estate, 
investment trusts, uh, of course, real estate prices are the big factor, although uh, there are other uh, kinds of uh, real estate investment trusts looking at such things as uh, assisted living facilities, uh, nursing, um, uh, acute care hospitals, uh, cell phone towers, and others that have the, the same benefits uh, from tax standpoint as real estate investment trusts, um, but are in other categories. But for the asset category as a whole, uh, real estate, including commercial real estate, uh, industrial uh, real estate properties, residential, uh, and all that will uh, be the key uh, risk factor there. And then finally, um, uh, as far as the table goes, dividend growth stocks. And these are stocks not uh, selected because of a high dividend yield. Uh, you have to be a little wary of some of those because sometimes that's really a market signal that the company is about to cut the dividend in half. So what looks like a, an excellent dividend yield today uh, may turn out to be an illusion. But these are uh, stocks that uh, have a modest yield but have a good record of raising that dividend. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, why the, it's important to have that component in the, uh, in the portfolio. Um, not listed here, but uh, one uh, uh, category that cuts across several of these is closed-end bond funds. And uh, these are funds, uh, it's like an open-end mutual fund, except that it's a, uh, you know, a stock that trades on the exchange, and uh, you can trade it intraday and so on, you know, like an ETF. But it's a uh, managed portfolio, typically with the use of leverage to increase the overall yield. And they may invest in uh, bonds and preferreds in uh, REITs. Uh, there are a variety of, um, of them out there. And uh, uh, though there um, you have, though, because of the leverage, uh, the use of you know, borrowed money to build up the, uh, you know, the yield on the instrument, uh, you have that interest rate risk and refinancing risk on top of whatever the underlying risk in the, the uh, types of securities that they're, uh, they're buying. Um, now, uh, I've talked a lot about this, uh, uh, about the different, different kinds of things. What kind of yields are we talking about in a portfolio consisting of these types of assets? Well, in the newsletter each month we uh, publish, and you can see in, uh, in the issue that you have, and again, if you came in late and didn't pick this up, I'd encourage you to pick up a copy of the newsletter on one of the chair, seats, seats uh, at the back, back of the room or uh, here on the side. And um, so we publish uh, each month uh, a low-risk, medium-risk, and high-risk portfolio, which investors can uh, choose. They may um, buy that actual portfolio or if not, just use it as a benchmark to get some confidence that the recommendations in the uh, newsletter are, uh, are uh, uh, generally useful. Um, currently, the uh, yield on the low-risk portfolio is uh, right around 8%. Um, in the, uh, oh, I, I beg your pardon. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, uh, the low-risk portfolio, 5.38%. The medium risk, 7.06%. The high risk, 9.95%. That was as of the end of August, and we'll be updating that in a few days. And the, uh, uh, it is uh, worthwhile to note that while you're emphasizing income, and that is the primary objective, uh, you'd like to get some appreciation as well, but it's, you're not expecting the same type of uh, capital gains that you'd get in uh, common stocks. Nonetheless, you have participated in some of the uh, uh, market rally this year. So in the low, port low uh, quality portfolio, the year-to-date return uh, 8%, uh, the medium risk 9.75, and the uh, high risk uh, just about 12%. So uh, you've gotten some of that upside as well. Um, now, <clears throat> um, the uh, the other topic I want to discuss here is that uh, you do um, want to have a growth component as opposed to a strict fixed income portfolio, and this is the reason why. Um, if uh, you were to retire at age 65, uh, the uh, life expectancies, as you can see, are over 20 years, you know, slightly longer for women than for men, and 
uh, a one out of four uh, uh, chance that one member of that couple will live uh, to age 98. So you have a long time, and, and inflation, although it has been running at a low level in recent years, works kind of like compound interest, and it can really build up. One bright note, by the way, about these actuarial tables is that if you live to 104, you will not die of cancer because at that point, the cells can no longer divide fast enough uh, to accomplish that. So something for all of us to, uh, uh, to aim for. Um, but the, um, uh, the reason that it's uh, so important, uh, it, it, again, is because inflation, even at the low rate, not to mention the possibility that inflation will escalate in the next 20 years, uh, even at a fairly low rate, takes quite a bit out of your purchasing power. So that if you had retired 20 years ago on literally a fixed income portfolio with no uh, possibility of that income ever rising, you would at this point have lost uh, one third of the purchasing power uh, from when you got into it. So I'd like to say that if you go to the golf course, they'll only uh, let you play 12 holes because that's, uh, that's how much you've lost. So. Uh, it, it, this is uh, a very significant issue, and fortunately, there is a solution. In addition to the master limited partnerships and real estate investment trusts that uh, uh, tend to increase their uh, distributions over time, uh, dividend growth stocks, uh, as, I, as I spoke about earlier, also have that characteristic. And uh, this was a um, this is a selection of. Uh, issues, uh, dividend uh, growth stocks that we've used that were there as far back as uh, 2009 and were, you know, have been raising dividends since then. And uh, you, you've, gotten, you've stayed well ahead of inflation with that. Now, this doesn't represent the entire portfolio, of course. It's just a component because you don't want to uh, detract too much from the high current yield on the overall portfolio by these uh, stocks that are starting out with yields of you know, typically two or three percent. Um, but the good news here is that uh, even with a modest component um, of the uh, uh, dividend growth stocks in the portfolio, um, you, uh, you know, can uh, do, uh, uh, do well and make up for that uh, loss of purchasing power. So the solid line in this graph is a pure fixed income portfolio with a 5% yield, which is uh, pretty good in today's market. Um, and uh, by the way, 5% uh, is the expected long-term rate of return on stocks at this point, because those have historically been three percentage points above uh, long-term treasury yields, were, which are actually a little less than 2% currently. So uh, that's bad news for the municipalities that are assuming a 7.5% return on their pension portfolios. Uh, it's basically not going to happen, uh, although they have high hopes uh, for the private equity making up for uh, the, um, uh, you know, the lower expected returns on stocks and bonds. Um, but so that, the solid line is a uh, pure 5% uh, fixed income portfolio, and uh, the uh, the uh, dotted line includes a component of dividend growth, uh, which has uh, just a 2.5% initial yield, but grows at 8%. And you can see that in year seven, that uh, overtakes the, uh, uh, the yield on the, uh, uh, the pure fixed income portfolio. So, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it is uh, quite valuable to add this to a an income portfolio. So uh, to summarize the uh, points here, uh, the answer to the uh, basic question I, uh, of uh, the title of this, uh, this uh, presentation is that yes, high income is compatible with safety, uh, uh, and you have to be uh, you know, sure about what you're defining as safety because you have to accept some interim price fluctuations as the price that you pay. That's what you're getting rewarded for with that high level of current income. Uh, it's important to control the portfolio-wide volatility by diversifying by asset class as well as by individual securities. And uh, important to focus on the steadiness of that yield, 
notwithstanding the cyclical rises and declines in the portfolio. The worst mistake is to get too carried away either on the upside or on the downside and wind up uh, counterproductively. Some of you may have heard quoted studies that I think the most reliable numbers are about one percentage point, which is the difference between uh, mutual funds, and this would include equity uh, funds and others, but 1% is the difference between the uh, returns earned on the mutual funds and the returns own, uh, earned by owners of mutual funds. And so how could there be any difference? Because the mutual funds are owned by the shareholders, they get the return. Well, the problem is they invariably uh, sell out at the bottom and buy at the top, and as a result of that, they wind, wind up earning uh, considerably less than the return. So don't make that mistake. Um, uh, focus on the income and uh, don't get carried away by the uh, ups and downs uh, along the way. And uh, do not view any security purchase as a one-time decision, uh, but it's important to monitor each issue's financial condition in order to maintain that uh, uh, and that consistency. Um, I did want to uh, leave you with one uh, example of a uh, current recommendation. This is the, the current month's uh, pick of the month in our newsletter, uh, which is the Flaherty and Crumrine Total Return Fund. It's on the New York Exchange uh, with the ticker FLC. Um, <clears throat> and the yield at uh, the end of August was 6.4%. Uh, uh, a slight premium to net asset value. Obviously, it's attractive if you can buy them at discounts to net asset value in a closed-end fund, and we do have others uh, that are, in, in some cases, as much as a 10% discount to net asset value currently, which tends to be a pretty good level to be uh, buying them. So in a sense, in, a, in effect, you're buying the portfolio owned by the closed-end fund at less than you could go out and buy them, or would have to pay if you went out and bought them uh, on, uh, uh, on the exchange, so uh, particularly attractive. Uh, there's a leverage ratio of about 33% on uh, this closed-end fund, which is a typical level that you see here. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, you largely have qualified dividends here, so your tax rate is considerably lower than the ordinary income rate, uh, but in the range of 15 to 20%. And uh, what this fund owns is primarily uh, preferred, uh, preferred securities. Um, I haven't spoken, uh, given limitations of time, about convertibles, which are also a component, and you'll see uh, some uh, previous recommendations in the newsletter, both convertible bonds and convertible preferreds. Another option there is also to buy uh, closed-end funds uh, that own convertibles, and a couple that are uh, recommended uh, on, uh, that you'll see in past recommendations on the website are uh, the Advent Claymore Convertible Securities Income Fund with the ticker AVK. Um, they uh, indicated yield there is 9.56%, again, with the benefit of leverage, which is a little on the higher side, uh, at 41.8%, uh, but that is at almost an 11% discount to net asset value currently. And uh, the other one I would mention would be the Calamos uh, Convertible and High Income Fund, uh, ticker CHY, also on the uh, uh, New York Exchange, a little more moderate leverage of 29% uh, and an indicated yield there of 9.20%, um, still not uh, too shabby. And that one would be recommended, uh, uh, well, we, uh, we also recommend uh, individual uh, convertibles in the newsletter. And, uh, you know, those are retained on the, uh, the website. So, uh, as I mentioned, the last page here has uh, information if you'd like to check out the website. Uh, the, uh, you know, public part of that has, uh, in addition to the most recent, or, or uh, one past uh, newsletter, um, it has uh, uh, some information about investing in this uh, uh, general area, and, um, and then uh, subscribers, of course, get access to all of the uh, historical data and some uh, information uh, describing how uh, some of the technical points of investing in uh, income securities. So um, with that, if there are questions about anything I've addressed or another topic related, uh, let me try to address those. Let me start here.
Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I beg I didn't explain that well. That was, th this was showing the real yield, you know, the inflation adjusted. So while, yeah, it stayed level in term, at the nominal rate of, you know, 5% that you started out with, um, it was declining in terms of your purchasing power uh, because of inflation through that period. Thank you. I, I did neglect that very important point. So, yes, sir. Yes, um, the question was about expense ratios, and uh, it is a, a, a very significant issue. Uh, we certainly look at that in making the recommendations. With all of these, um, uh, they're a trade-off, um, and uh, you know, I'd love to find, uh, uh, we would certainly recommend if we had you know, some of the lowest uh, expense ratio, the, you know, the highest yield, uh, the you know, the, the best uh, performance record. And, and that, by the way, with the closed end funds is the other big part is looking at the uh, record and also is the same management and team, team in place that achieved that record. It doesn't really do you any good if they've had a complete turnover. Now, eventually, the head portfolio manager is going to retire, uh, but they, if they've done a good job, they have a good succession plan. They've trained people who can maintain that same uh, uh, skill along the way. So we look at all those things. Yes, uh, uh, two, you know, th there's some that are even, you know, 3% ex expense ratio, you know, not all that attractive from that standpoint, but that may be uh, 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 offset by uh, the other factors. Um, so uh, thank you for raising that point. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I, I'd have to say that we're not generally big fans of utilities. I know that, you know, others will have different views. Um, you can, there are some recommended uh, in the newsletter. Um, you know, we just have some longer con term concerns about the fundamentals, you know, given uh, environmental concerns, uh, you know, at, uh, um, you know, need uh, for replacing a lot of the uh, existing plant. Uh, um, as, uh, you know, with, with the move towards more renewables. Uh, you know, there are a lot of benefits from that, but it will be costly. And, you know, they are subject to um, the uh, regulation, which has always been an issue, but, you know, as they, um, uh, you know, that uh, can have an effect on them as well. So I think, uh, you know, it's great that they have done so, so, uh, so well. This has been a great year for them, but it, uh, I would say that probably uh, would be a good time to review that, maybe trim back a little bit, uh, at least on that, and look at some other, um, uh, some other categories at this time. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and uh, as I say, I, there, are, there are others that are still offering, um, you know, surprisingly high yields in this environment. Um, and, you know, par partly the utilities have done so well, a classic thing, because they've been in favor you know, people do view them as being uh, recession-proof, although that's somewhat you know, less true than it was years ago uh, because they're not uh, as typically as you know, pure um, regulated utilities that are, you know, assume, well, we'll automatically get a, um, uh, a rate increase from the uh, Utility Commission. More and more they're involved in competitive markets um, and, of course, uh, you know, sensitive to the uh, the price spin, uh, swings in their, their fuel costs. Um, so uh, I would say, yeah, probably now is a particularly good time to think about diversifying away a little bit somewhat from utilities. Okay, let me take the one in the back and I'll come back. Yes, uh, yes, sir. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, well, that is, um, uh, uh, sort of been a, um, 
you know, sort of the, uh, a selling point, if you will, for high yield bonds, you know, specifically, um, and, you know, by extension you know, funds, investing in them, in them um, uh, really from, you know, the late 70s when it started to become a very significant market. Um, it, uh, they do um, have, if you look at correlations uh, with other asset classes, they tend to be low with both equities and bonds, so they do have that uh, characteristic. And um, the sharp ratios have tended to be good. This would be um, uh, basically a, a measure of the volatility relative to the rate of return. They've tended to stack up fairly well. Um, Treasury bonds have tended to do very poorly there, I think largely because uh, investors uh, feel because of the safety or they may even have regulatory requirements uh, in the case of institutions to own Treasury, so they tend to get overpriced as a result of that. So, yeah, they, ha they have had that characteristic. I don't want to oversell the point. I think in the early days uh, there was some tendency to kind of play around with the numbers a little bit and make the, uh, the story look a little better than it was. But inherently, um, yeah, high-yield bonds are uh, sort of a hybrid of uh, bonds and stocks. Uh, the former Treasury Secretary, Lauren Summers, coined the term equity and drag as a description of them. And uh, they, uh, yeah, that is a, uh, an attraction. I wouldn't want to have 100% of my money in high-yield bonds, but they, they do, as you say, sort of a, sort of a uh, built-in risk parity kind of a, an asset. Yes, sir. Well, one thing is that there are a few of them. Some of them uh, have converted to uh, corporate status. Uh, so this, from the supply uh, uh, side of it, uh, that's kind of a longer-term positive factor. Uh, the, the things that have hit the um, MLPs in, uh, over the last few years, really, is the drop in oil prices that um, will directly affect exploration and production companies, equipment and service companies. Uh, but if you're talking about pipelines, which are a big part of it, they're not um, that directly affected. A lot of their uh, contracts are, uh, well, uh, you know, they are, um, uh, and take, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a tool, right? Uh, so they're, they're charging for the volume that's transported rather than being tied to the uh, the price. At the low point, uh, when oil prices got down to you know, $26 a barrel, people started to get very concerned, well, well what if the uh, producers who are shipping it go bankrupt? Uh, they won't be able to live up to those contracts even though uh, they're there and uh, provide a lot of insurance. So uh, what we found is that there was actually price sensitivity even of the pipelines despite their uh, insulation. We sort of, uh, at that point, started taking a closer look, because some of them are either in producing areas with low finding costs, which are probably going to continue to produce even if oil prices drop substantially from here, or their contracts may be primarily with the end user, uh, such as an electric utility, as opposed to the shipper of the gas and the utilities, although uh, I would say, yes, perhaps uh, saying absolutely recession-proof is... Uh, Incorrect. They're, they're pretty stable. The demand is going to be pretty stable coming from there. Uh, so those have been some of the factors. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I do expect that at some point you'll see prices rise. You know, part of the, uh, the drop in prices, uh, well, is really the increased shale production and then Saudi Arabia's attempt to wipe out the shale production by uh, dropping prices, which clearly was not successful. Um, you know, I think that uh, the uh, you know, producers, uh, you know, in terms of raising capital, uh, if they're consistently not earning their rates of return because there's just too much uh, shale, uh, oil, and gas out there, um, you know, they're going to cut back on uh, the spending. And so, one way or another, I think the, the prices will, uh, you know, will rise uh, eventually, and uh, we'll see some stabilization. Um, and uh, in the meantime, you're, you know, say you're collecting a very, uh, very good yield on the MLPs. Yes, sir.
Oh, a, uh, AVK, was AVK, yes. Um, uh, that was the Advent Claymore uh, Fund, yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, yes. The question was, uh, how did that correlation work in 2008? And uh, yes, you get the periods, uh, you know, so my, my uh, uh, definition of a severe bear market is that the period when all the correlations go to one, and uh, diversification has only a limited benefit in that period. Now, very high quality bonds in that period did, and I, you know, I think you can expect, uh, again, if I mean, I don't think we'll see anything comparable to that uh, in this cycle, but in a uh, sharp downturn, you will see uh, Treasury yields drop, and so the very highest quality bonds will uh, actually benefit uh, from that. So you got some effect, but, um, you know, the preferreds got hit more in that period than you would have expected based on the fundamentals, uh, the earnings of the uh, issuing companies. A lot of that had to do with the relative illiquidity of those securities and liquidity dried up very considerably as part of that uh, downturn uh, in the market. So, um, yeah, 2008 event, you know, which was generally considered the worst downturn since the Great Depression of the 1930s, uh, you, you have less ability to cushion the downside. Uh, now, many of those, you know, uh, rebounded very strongly. And, uh, you know, 2009, the return on the high yield index was 57 percent. So you did have uh, very strong uh, rebounds after that, but you had uh, quite an unprecedented depression in prices in that market uh, during that period. Um, I, I would say, I wrote, uh, and you might look if you're interested, I uh, just uh, about three weeks ago, and I think, wrote a piece on Forbes.com, uh, which is a free site. Uh, about this question, of, uh, there are people out there saying, well, the next recession will be worse than 2008, 2009. And what they need to explain, if they believe that, is how that will be the case, given that what was distinctive about the Great uh, Recession of 08, 09 was that it was a full-blown banking system collapsed, you know, to the point where banks were unwilling to lend overnight to one another because they were so fearful of uh, what might happen by the next morning. Uh, how could that happen despite the extreme uh, tightening of banking regulations in reaction to those very events? Um, in addition to which, uh, I was at a talk by Bill Dudley, the former uh, president of the New York Federal Reserve, who pointed out that in addition, savings rates were very low going into 2008 uh, because people had used their house like an ATM and borrowed up at very little savings so that when the recession hit, they had to cut back very severely on their spending. Saving rates have gone up considerably from that period, so another reason to suspect that when we inevitably get into the next recession, uh, we will not have as severe a downturn um, you know, between the banking system and the uh, condition of the, uh, the consumer at this point. Let me take one over here, and then I, I can come back. Yes. Well, um, they uh, are sensitive, again, you know, even the pipelines which are inherently fairly insulated from the, uh, you know, the commodity price swings. Uh, as a practical matter, they are now showing sensitivity to that. Um, <clears throat> uh, the oil prices, of course, recently got a little bit of a boost, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, from the attack on the Saudi uh, production facilities uh, just as of this morning. Uh, the, uh, you know, CNBC was reporting, well, that they've largely recovered uh, from that because uh, uh, Saudi Arabia has been able to get their production facilities back on line, uh, you know, sooner than was been expected. Um, energy prices from, uh, you know, 1865 or so, uh, when they started producing uh, you know, petroleum in Pennsylvania, um, uh, they have always been volatile and in uh, fairly unpredictable ways. Um, I think that next to trying to time, then, then trying to time the securities markets, trying to 
predict energy prices uh, over the short run is uh, a, a kind of a fool's errand. But, um, uh, you know, again, I think that we're likely to see, uh, you know, some rise uh, with, uh, uh, you know, partly, you know, with inflation and partly as a result of, uh, you know, I think that prices have remained lower for longer perhaps than people were, had expected. Um, but again, a lot of that has been related to this boom in the shale uh, production. And I can't see um, companies being able to raise or wanting to invest in exploration production to the same extent, you know, to maintain the, uh, the present relative imbalance between supply and demand. Um, so I think that uh, we'll uh, likely see some pulling back, uh, some improvement in the supply and balance, uh, supply demand balance from the standpoint of the producers and at least a gradual, you know, if not you know, straight up kind of, uh, but a, a sort of a gradual rise over uh, over coming years. Do my best. Uh. Okay, well, I, I think we probably do want to make, uh, again, if you didn't uh, pick up a uh, one of the handouts on the back, I think in the uh, seats in the back, they're still available. Thank you very much. and. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.